Peace, love, and life, family. It's your girl, Morgan Renee Myers. Tune in with you again for another story time with more of my, that is me, Morgan Renee Myers. So we are in the book, Recapturing the African Mind by Brother Bruce Bridges um, out of Raleigh, North Carolina. I met him at a cultural arts, um, excuse me, uh, African cultural cultural market in my city of Greensboro, North Carolina some years back and purchased this book from him and got it signed and so so far I've read um two chapters out of it. The last chapter was focusing on um how religion let me just read the name of it. Chapter two was called Missionaries as Tools in the Mind Control of Africans. And it was talking about how like mm -hmm. um the Catholic Church and um hold on who's texting me? Mama Donna. Yeah, people just... Okay, random text message. Anyways. um, Yeah, so the last chapter was talking about how, like, the Catholic Church and Catholicism and all that was being structured and how people... um, mm -hmm. Portuguese was being sent out to pretty much infiltrate all the lands, any islands, and wherever you go, saying you can dominate and you could teach um, the word of Jesus and all the snap. And so um, it was even saying how, like... Uh, in was it Nigeria? Uh, whatever the king was at the time, he um, ended up changing his name to a Portuguese name. They started speaking the whole the whole country. They started speaking um, the language of the Portuguese. They started learning about Catholicism. Like everything they were doing were assimilating to um, the por Portuguese. And I was just so mind blown because I know as melanated beings that were so powerful. I'm like, how were we just letting people come over and tell us what they gonna teach us? Like, and, and make us change our language. Like, um, the last quote I was reading, I was reading in, like, a uh, African accent. Um, it had to do with someone sharing their experience with, um, like, they couldn't speak their, um, their native tongue in school, you know, they had these pictures of like a white Jesus and um, they had to follow all the Portuguese rules and they pretty much um, ended up forgetting their own history, their own African history, because they were learning in, in history. They weren't allowed to learn about Africans. They were only taught about Europeans and how Africans, um, you know, helped them. And then it even mentioned that they breezed over slavery. Like they didn't even speak about slavery um, throughout the Americas and stuff. It was... Let me read it. It said, um, although an American sponsored school, nothing was ever taught about slavery except the fact that Abraham Lincoln abolished it in 1863. Black people in America were all very comfortable now that the is slavery issue was settled. That's what she said. Peace, my sister. What's the title of this book? Um, reading is very fundamental. Um, Saladin Amar. Um, it's called Recapturing the African Mind. Um, and maybe you didn't see it, so let me not be smart. Uh, but that is the title of this live, um, which is the title of the book, Recapturing the African Mind by Brother Bruce Bridges. So we're going to hop right into it. <clears throat> um, we're in chapter three and it's titled The Manufacturing of Slaves in America. Uh, Mama Donna said that's why Shaka Zulu was fighting the Portuguese because he and his tribe resisted. And that's what I was going to say. I was like, how could they come and teach us? And this? I was like, but maybe there was some type of threat or some type of, you know, like killing people off. And I could imagine if my life would be at stake, depending on, you know, how I operated and how my energy and spirit was set up. I, too, might um, transition, you know, my language and my thought and and all of that just to protect my life. So. Um, but yeah, so here we go. The manufacturing of slaves in America starts with a quote by Bob Marley, or probably as a song. Um, we build our pen we build your penitentiaries, we build your schools, brainwash education trying to make us your fools. Christianity and education as methods. While missionaries, soldiers, humanitarians, and the clergy operated on the minds of continental Africans from the 14th century to the present, similar methods of mind control were being employed by Europeans for Africans transported to the so-called New World. Africans forcibly removed from their homeland were manufactured into slaves in the United States. This was necessary since slaves are made and not born. 
Peace, Brother Mark. There were slight differences between the processes used in America and those used in Africa. Variations in the processes were based upon location, resources, and psychological attitudes. The two institutions that have remained a major part of the equation in mind control, both in Africa and America, are churches and the schools. Now, sidebar, I'm going to do a whole separate live on this, but I had a conversation with my mom last night. I grew up in a church, grew up Baptist. My mom, like, was church hurt very early on, like, right before I was born. Um, And so, I don't recall her going to church at all my entire life. Well, there was a period in time when I was a teenager where she went to a church. Um, It was a very small church, and then she, she, she didn't last long. She wasn't there maybe even half the year. I'm not sure, but it wasn't a long period of time. Um, But other than that... I, and I'm not used to, you know, her reading the Bible, teaching me anything about Jesus, none of that. Like, I was taking an effort upon myself to make sure I was getting to church. So, um, now, she's in her 50s. She started going back to church maybe about two, three years ago. I've, I've visited a few times. Um, I'm sure her and the pastor definitely, because he calls me sometimes, would like for me to come more. But I don't come for a few reasons, and I'm not going to get into that now on this particular live, but... Um, Sometimes it just feels very hypocritical to see, not to say that people can't change or whatever, but like, um, it's just like the, the church and the home life balance just don't be matching up all the time. And so where I'm at on my spiritual journey, I have a deeply rooted connection with the higher power, the creator. And I understand that source is also within me. And so I was just trying to have a conversation with her because we was talking about like marriage and some stuff out the Bible. And I was just like, well, you know, I don't I don't feel like the government needs to be in it for me to marry or to dedicate my life to some man before or under God. Like, I don't feel like I don't I just don't like the idea that the government has to be involved, that I have to sign a paper and that they got to keep tabs on us and our money and all this and that. But then there are things like, you know, not being able to have access to certain things um, if, you know, um, something were to happen to him. And so we was talking about that. She was like, well, you can't. Um, well, what does the Bible say? Don't you believe in the Bible? I said, well, you know, the Bible definitely has some good context because that's our text. That's African text. But, you know, also it was, uh, it was a lot of stuff put in it. It was, um, you know, mistranslated, all kind of stuff. Like, I said, I didn't done all kind of stuff to the, to the word. But, like, yeah, definitely the parables, The it definitely has some, some great... Um, Contact and she said, "Well, you can't pick and choose. You can't pick which." But I said, "Well, why can't I? If I know that this text has been told the hell up, like, <laughs> um, and again, my union has nothing to do with the government." And I was just trying to explain to her how, like, um, Christianity and religion has been um, full of brainwashing and. And she was saying, um, and I was just trying to get her because we really can't talk about a lot of stuff because she usually shuts down the conversation. And so she was starting to do that. She just kept, she do this little, oh, it'd be annoying the fuck out of me. She do this thing where she'd be, um, just repeat the same thing over and up. She was like, well, well, okay, I'm done. Well, uh, well, just cause we agree, it's not going to make just, well, if we don't agree, I don't see what's the point of talking about it. What's the point of talking about if we don't agree? I said, mom, like, just because we don't agree don't mean the conversation have to stop. Like, I'm not trying to debate you or argue or even persuade you. I'm just trying to express what it is that I've learned and why I think the way that I do. And I'm trying to share that with you. So, and then you're asking me stuff about my life and I'm giving you my response to it. And you just want to shut that. Well, if we don't agree, I don't understand why we still talking about it. If we don't agree, I said, Ma, like, we don't have to agree. That's more reason why we should be communicating so that we can at least get to an understanding. I said, like, you're not even questioning anything. Like, you're just taking what's given to you and you're not even asking why. And I'm trying to tell you why I don't believe. And I was just trying to explain to her, like, you know, Mom, politics, um, has been doing a number on you know religion and what it is that you even believe in and so i know she'd be looking at me funny when i always say stuff about like the government and I, now i'm not one of them conspiracy theorists that just put everything on the government but come on it's 2020 we in america you got to be real and understanding about the powers in this world and how it's structured and how it's um affecting us as a whole okay so like let's not deny that so i understand that i can't i don't have that space to really talk with my mom like that all i can do is leave um live my life hopefully we'll get to a point where we can at least have open dialogue um i'll be wanting to do stuff sometimes like send her certain scriptures or send her certain links to stuff that could better explain what it is i'll be trying to say but 
I don't want to like overwhelm her with information. She probably won't watch it anyway. Um, and I also don't want it to be like, you know, I'm antagonizing her to see my side. Like I just literally wish she would just shut up and be open to listening and not seem so aggravated and tired and want to shut down a conversation every time something of truth comes up. That's another story for another day, honey. Ooh, getting in my feelings. Solid didn't say, I'm going to purchase that book. It must be added to my personal library. My understanding of history, what you read thus far is accurate. Awesome. Are you a uh, solid in? Are you, what country are you in? Are you in America or I'm trying to get to know some of the people that follow my page? All right. So the two institutions that have remained a major part of the equation in mind control, both in Africa and America are the churches and schools. Okay. Excuse me. Considerations on the western side of the Atlantic for mind control were based upon Africans being on alien soil. On the eastern side of the Atlantic, Europeans exercised their mental domination as well as their physical domination to amass wealth through the control of land and natural resources of Africa. In the New World, Africans themselves became the primary resource to amass European fortunes through the plantation system of America. Seasoning or preparation for a slave's life work took place in the Caribbean islands before the arrival of Africans in America. Seasoning? Oh, this book frustrates me. One way of seasoning was to allow the Africans, upon their arrival in the islands, to spend time with the veteran slaves mm -hmm. and become acquainted with the slaves' work routine. Compare this to the training of the dam and the training of the fowl in the section under horse training methods. Another aspect of seasoning was called breaking in. Mm -hmm. In that process, a specialist would train the Africans to be slaves. Africans were taught to obey the master's every command. Mm -hmm. All right, Mickey, I don't have time to wave back right now, honey. Um, <clears throat> whippings and other processes would train the Africans to be slaves. Africans were taught to obey the master's every command. Whippings and other physical means were used to control Africans and they were taught this during the breaking in process. The time period for breaking in was one to three years. Oh my soul. There was a complete alteration of the African's mind in the manufacturing of the Negro in America. As part of the seasoning process, meaningful African birth names were replaced by meaningless alien European names. African languages were completely banned and the Negro was required to speak French, English, or Spanish. This was because of the necessity for operation of the plantations of America as well as the Caribbean plantations and so that the master could understand them. Not only were there language and name changes, Africans were spiritually mutilated when they were forced to worship gods that were not their own. African practices and rituals were changed to the mass or hymnal, and natural emotionalism was replaced by a dry, dead, emotionless experience. Daudi Arjaniya Azibo in African Psychology and Historical Perspective and Related Commentary lists six factors from Vincent Harding's book, There is a River, involved in the creation of the slave mentality. And it's listed below. I love how he quotes different authors and texts throughout his uh, writing. So, number one, the establishment of strict discipline over the captive African community in America, the development of unconditional submission. Two, the development within black people of a sense of personal inferiority, especially in relation to their African ancestry, which is why a lot of us turn up our nose or joke at Africans or just don't understand um, anything about the continent, the culture or our prior selves. And, you know, we just kind of be disgusted and look down on it. Instead of trying to understand, trying to get a relationship with it. If it's not, because I know some people that are part of my tribe and they don't celebrate Kwanzaa. And I love Kwanzaa. So, okay, maybe Kwanzaa ain't your thing. But in what ways do you honor yourself, honor knowing yourself, um, honor your ancestors, get an understanding of where you come from? Most of us legit, well, I ain't going to say most of us, but a lot of us because we're taught in schools, legit just think our history started as slavery. And that's all we know about ourselves is that we came about it at, and now we have the freedom to do what we want. Like, no, you got to know where you came from and who we are and who we were and who we are. 
to know where we're going. Mama Donna said, unfortunately, Africans were brainwashed as soon as the enslaved hit the shores. So that is what they adapted to because they were unable to practice the spirituality of God, which was praising creation. So that old time religion was the only thing for centuries that Africans knew. However, many Africans practice their own spiritually spirituality secretly using codes and drum beats. And then they took our drum. Dissemination of our culture done. Spirituality mutilate, mutilated. That's mm, 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 child. Whew, number three, the development of raw fear to awe them with a sense of their master's enormous power. Of course, behind the power of the master stood the power of the local and national governments. Four, the establishment within the enslaved person of a sense that the master's welfare was really synonymous with his own. So, you know, like um, when they be certain shows you see and they joke, they be like, master sick, I'm sick too then. Like, you know, like whatever making sure that master is good and if he's not then you're not so the the establishment within the enslaved person of a sense that the master's welfare was really synonymous with his own five the creation of a willingness of the afro-american captives to accept the slaveholder standard of their of conduct as their own and six the development within the captive people of a habit of perfect dependence upon those who claim to be their masters and again this is um an excerpt out of Dayudi Ajani Ya Azibo's book called African Psychology and Historical Perspective and Related Commentary. Um, he was quoting six factors from Vincent Harding's book called There is a River. So according to Azibo, Harding goes on to say that only through a rejection of these practices can the mind rebuild itself with new thoughts. Let me read that again. According to Azebo, Harding goes on to say that only through a rejection. Sorry, got 10 people texting me. Um. Harding goes on to say that only through a rejection of these practices can the mind rebuild itself with new thoughts. Physical control was often applied to ready the African for his psychological demise. This process is discussed at length in the section of this book dealing with horse training, which is pages 95 to 103. He make me want to hop to that section because he didn't mention horse training twice. Already. Horse training methods applied to enslaved Africans and the tale of black beauty. I think that's the next chapter, so I'll just be patient and wait. Um, African history must be examined to discover the necessity to go to such great lengths to train and traumatize the African mind. Africans were well aware that their history was an ancient history and that all Africans are brothers and sisters. Therefore, they all shared the pride and glory of their ancient ancestry. While most Western Africans were farmers, they nevertheless lived in societies with large standing armies. The African societies that did not have large standing armies were defended by the men, boys, and women within their villages. These were not docile people waiting to be enslaved, but a people who understood war and warfare. When the first Africans were captured and delivered to the West Indies, where they eventually made Europeans such as Bacardi, wealthy in the distillery business they were uncontrollable what when the first africans were captured and delivered to the west indies where they eventually made europeans such as bacardi wealthy in the distillery business they were uncontrollable they ran away and formed maroon groups burned plantations and murdered whites a great many Africans die in their quest to regain their freedom, and the loss of large numbers of captive Africans meant financial ruin for white investors. What is Saladin said? There's a 64 years of hidden history that they kept from us while during the dehumanizing of the black man and woman in America, captured from America in the first arrivals. Their method was so wicked, diabolical that it had to be that it had to be a destroyed history. This. Y'all, this is so sad. Mm. Wow. How are they so how are they so witty enough to come? Oh, I just don't see how they tricked us like this. How we fell for this. And why they so why are you using uh violence and and oh all right, y'all. Don't get me started. Let me just read the book. 
So lost a lot of lives. Financial room for white investors. I'm never drinking Bacardi again. I didn't know that. The first enslaved Africans in the West Indies eventually made Europeans such as Bacardi wealthy in the distillery business. Ugh. Consequently, it was necessary for them to devise methods to diminish the Africans' natural will to resist their enslavement. Okay, because we was turning up and killing their asses and wasn't standing for it. So they had to come up with new ways to keep... Okay. Christianity was an effective tool. Once you get us scared with heaven and hell, you're going to act right because you don't know what your afterlife because you forgot what your uh, religious history was when they before when they enslaved you. Which I don't see how you could forget that unless you was a child, but I digress. Consequently, it was necessary to devise methods to diminish the Africans' natural will to resist their enslavement. Christianity was an effective tool. Once it had penetrated the minds of the newly arrived Africans, they became easier to manage. Consequently, the conversion to Christianity was often cited as a major justification for Africans being enslaved. This use, The use of Christianity as a psychological tool was not without its drawbacks and critics. Would-be missionaries to the slaves did not receive permission to baptize them because ultimately baptizing the slaves meant that it would become necessary for the slaves to be freed. Moreover, because there was a certain feeling of equality by slaves who had become Christianized, some slaveholders claimed that the master and slave relationship would be disrupted if the missionaries could have access to the slaves. Thus, the doctrine of the Christian church would say that all men were equal in God's sight was a dangerous doctrine under the circumstances of slavery and there were continual complaints by slaveholders on this subject. Mama Donna said, research your tribes. Find out as much as possible about your ancestor. We are Yoruba. I'm getting ready for work, but it fills my spirit as I listen to you teach the wisdom of the research by Dr. Bridges. I say, love the Maroons who still exist in the islands. There's a book called The Destruction of the Black Civilization by Chancellor Wisdom. All of this opens your mind. Oh, let me screenshot that. Okay, Mama Donna, have a great day of work, love. Thank you for tuning in. I appreciate you, sis. Um, Yes, got to teach the people. And I put this on my YouTube. And there's a lot of kids that subscribe to my YouTube because I was reading um, Roll of Thunder, Hear My Cry and Richard Wright's Black Boy. And those are required reading in some schools. So, giving them youth the knowledge, honey. Um, mm, mm, mm. Okay. Uh, the use of Christianity as a psychological tool was not without its drawbacks and critics. Okay, wait a minute. I read that. They'd be freed. Okay. Nonetheless, Christianity was deemed so important for Africans as well as Native Americans that there were instructions sent from the British crown to a special council that had been established. Excuse me. This council was called the Council for Foreign Plantations. In 1660, the council was urged as follows. And you are to consider how such of the natives, Native Americans, or such as are purchased Africans by you from other parts to be servants or slaves may be tested may be best invited into the Christian faith and be made capable of being baptized thereunto, it being to the honor of our crown and of the Protestant religion that all persons in any of our dominions should be taught the knowledge of God and be made acquainted with the mysteries of salvation. Cited in Marcus Jernigan, um, I think this book is called Slavery and Conversion in the American Colonies, American Historical Review, Volume 2. He be citing, honey. I have to go back through and read all this stuff he cites. Mama Donna said, I visited the Whitney plantation and the first stop was the church. A Bible in one hand and a whip in the other. Go figure. Ooh, child. Almost every apologist for slaves being Christianized felt the need to prove that European Christianity would make better slaves. On page 14 of a letter sent from the Bishop of London in 1727, the following was stated. And so far in Christianity, from discharging men from the duties of the station and condition in which it found them, that it lays them under stronger obligation to perform those duties with the greatest diligence and fidelity, not only from the fear of men, but from a sense of duty to God and the belief and expectation of a future account. The role of the church in the planting of racism in the United States was discussed by Reverend Kyle Hasselden in an article entitled 11 a.m. Sunday is our most segregated hour. The only enslaved escaped with the assistance of the Native Americans in the hills. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. 
Oh, wow. I would love to read a story about that or hear more about that. How Native Americans helped enslaved Africans escape. Oh, wow. But that's that spiritual connection because we were already spiritually in tune. and We already understand that nature is God. And we practiced and knew about that. And then we connected with some other individuals and we could go hide out in the hills. Them white, them white folk ain't know how to navigate. They needed us. Okay, to survive, thrive, to build, all of that. There's no way they could have been in cotton fields all day in the sun. Come on now. Could barely be on the beach in the sun for five hours. So, imagine. All right. Back to Reverend Kyle Hasselden. His article entitled 11 a.m. Sunday is our most segregated hour. It is as follows. The religious community in American society produce and sustain, sometimes on biblical grounds, the anti-Negro bias, which has permeated the American mind from the beginning of the nation until the present day. Out of the nation's religious community come biblically and doctrinally supported theories of racial inferiority and from the same source come immoral, unethical codes which justify the exploitation of the Negro and demanded that the white man hold himself in sanctifying aloofness from the Negro. Moreover, the patterns of segregation which divide the common life of the country racially had their beginning in the church before they found their perfection in the secular society. It was not the secular world which infused the church with this contemptuous views of the Negro and imposed the segregated life on the Christian community. These offerances appeared first in the religious community, even if we view the religious community in its narrowest definition. The white man distorted the Bible into a defense for slavery and taught the Negro the passive virtues of Christianity, partly in the hope of making him tractable and content with his servile life. The white Christian in developing American culture confused Christianity with morality, morality with gentility, and gentility with aloofness from the Negro. As early as 1630, a bare 10 years after the arrival of the first Negro slaves, white Christians condemned the crossing of the racial line as an abuse to the dishonor of God and shame of Christians. The first educational efforts for slaves by whites came through religious sources. A missionary society established in London, England in 1701 called the Society for the Propagation of the Gospel in Foreign Parts, or S. PGFP was designed especially for blacks and Indians in the colonies. Though it did not though it did work in most of the colonies, its most effective work was in South Carolina. In a school opened in 1743 by Reverend Alexander Green, we get information on what was being taught from reports of the SPGFP. Following is one such report. Hold on. Saladin said our Enslavement was ordained by God and our prophecy in Genesis fifteen thirteen through 15 is written that we will be enslaved in the last days for 400 years by strange people in a strange land before our divine deliverance. This is why you're so interested in knowledge of enlightenment because it's our time of mental and spiritual resurrection back into our divine selves. We are God's. I say, I believe it. This is in your face and clear. Go to any plantation and you will see the distortion. Mm. I have a friend who um I know he's I know he got some spiritual gifts. Um we spent some time together um after I graduated college. We moved out of state together. We were um working a job where it was commission only, going door to door in the cold of Chicago. Um and, and he and I haven't talked um that much in recent years, but um within these last few months we've linked up and done some business projects together and so Sending love and light and peace to brother Kobe Bryant and his family. Um, but after that transition yesterday, I hit him up and was like, have you been having any revelations recently? Because um, um, a man in my community who I respect, Baba Larry Donnell, he recently transitioned. Um, he owned a store called Africa and More, where um, that was the first store I ever was able to sell my crochet creations. And um, I think I was selling soaps and my oils and stuff. Um, he transitioned within the last week. So, and then, you know, Nipsey Hustle, it ain't even been a whole year yet um, with Nip. So it's like all this energy of like powerful people transitioning. And so I asked my friend, you know, have you been receiving any revelations? And he said, um, he was like within the last he says yes and like the next five years is gonna really like 
make or break some people is gonna really show some things and um you know people that ain't gonna be ready for it ain't gonna you know make it type deal so i was like wow but yeah i definitely um feel that um how do i pronounce your name i hope i'm saying your name wrong right uh saladin i gotta look on your page after um, i have so many people on my friends list and i don't always see everybody on my timeline so sometimes i don't know who's out there um but yeah let me get back to this book chat okay so we was reading um so it's talking about the first educational efforts for slaves came through whites. It was called the Society for the Propagation of the Gospel in Foreign Parts. It was designed especially for blacks and Indians in the colonies. Um, though it did work in most of the colonies, it was most effective work was in South Carolina in a school opened in 1743 by Reverend Alexander Garden. We get information on what was being taught from the reports of the SPGFP. Following is one such report. This organization hit upon the plan of purchasing two Negroes named Harry and Andrew and of qualifying them by thorough instruction in the principles of Christianity and the fundamentals of education to serve as schoolmasters to their people. Under the direction of the Reverend Mr. Gardham, the missionary who had directed the training of these young men, a building costing about 308 pounds was erected in Charleston, South Carolina. In the school which opened in this building in 1744, Harry and Andrew served as teachers. In the beginning, the school had about 60 young students and had a very good daily attendance for a number of years. The directors of the institution plan to send out annually between 30 and 40 youths well instructed in religion and capable of reading their Bibles to carry home and diffuse the same knowledge to their fellow slaves. It is highly probable such schools were attended largely by free persons of color. Because the progress of Negro education had been rather rapid, South Carolina enacted that year a law prohibiting any person from teaching or causing a slave to be taught or from employing or using a slave as a scribe in any manner of writing what enacted that year a law prohibiting any person from teaching or causing a slave to be taught or from employing or using a slave as a scribe in any manner of writing so the spgfp let me read what it means again i keep forgetting the Society for the Propagation of the Gospel in Foreign Parts had no real moral reasons for educating Africans in South Carolina. In fact, they were not really in opposition to the slave system. As usual, Europeans had a hidden agenda to their program. They knew that once the slaves had embraced the Bible and become Christians, the slaves would become more passive. One of the most famous missionaries sent to the colonies was Fran Francis Lejol who was sent in 1706 to Goose Creek, South Carolina. He would only baptize those Africans recommended to him by their masters. He taught the catechism not only to the servants, but also to Native Americans. Catechism, a system of questions and answers used for religious instructions in Christian churches, is usually very repetitive so that the propaganda sinks into the mind of the student. Um, refer to page 64 and 65 for a more detailed discussion of catechism. So I will go back because that was in the last chapter, but it was important and it won't hurt for me to refresh my memory and reread it again for you all. So, because I had never heard of it. Okay, so catechism. Let's see. So, um, in Burkina Faso, the Catholic priest targeted the village youth for classes in catechism. Um, according to John Ayato, Catechism is, and I hope I'm saying it right, catechism is a derivative of catechize, which comes from the Greek word catechine, a compound form, excuse me, from the prefix katu, which means thoroughly, and the verb keen, which means sound or resound, related to the English echo. Thus, originally, to catechize someone was to literally din, D-I-N, instruction into them, hence instruct orally thoroughly or completely according to webster's third new international unabridged dictionary the word din means a loud confused sound sometimes however applying to a noise or a malang of noises which though not necessarily painful totally or almost totally occupies the consciousness 
The purpose of the early mission schools in Africa was to create an African middle class. The European method of doing this was to win converts, workers, and African catechists to Christianity. These African catechists were to serve the European missionaries and ultimately the colonizing nation in the work of spreading the gospel. What better person to have the responsibility of indoctrinating the indigenous African mind than the African native catechist who spoke the local language and was one of the people himself? An example of the Catholic catechist is given in missionary actions and it is as follows we repeat it after the african nuns the nun for example asked the nun would say who created all of you and placed you on the earth and the answer given by an african nun god created us and placed us on this earth then the nun then all of you answer and then answer from african students would be god created all of us and placed us on this earth none who is god answer given by african nun God is all spirit and has no body. All of you repeat, all African students. God is spirit and has no body. None. Where is God? Answer given by African none. God is in heaven. Now all of you repeat, answer African students. God is in heaven. None. What is in heaven? Heaven is a pleasant place where good men see, stay, and enjoy themselves with God forever. Now all of you repeat, African students. Heaven is a pleasant place where good men see, stay, and enjoy themselves with God forever. This catechism was held for one or two hours. Through the use of intense catechism, missionaries were able to thoroughly occupy the consciousness of African students in the mission schools. Remember, all questions and answers were by trained Africans. Okay, so back to where I was at um, on page 80. So... One of the most famous missionaries sent to the colonies was Francis Lejar, who was sent in 1706 to Goose Creek, South Carolina. He would only baptize those Africans recommended to him by their masters. He taught the catechism not only to the servants, but also to Native Americans. Catechism, a system of questions and answers used for religious instructions in Christian churches, is usually very repetitive so that the propaganda sinks into the mind of the student. Lajaw appears to have kept the slaves under constant instruction for two years. Some masters did not like the work of Lajaw, but he hoped that the ones who did would influence the others. He had a way of disarming any opposition to his plan, and that was to require any Negro before baptism to consent to the following oath. You declare in the presence of God and before this congregation that you do not ask for the holy baptism out of any desire to free yourself from the duty and obedience you owe to your master while you live, but merely for the good of your soul and to partake of the graces and blessings promised to the members of the churches of Jesus Christ. This don't even sound like nothing Jesus would be standing for. <sighs> It was pointed out that convert, converted slaves would be taught to serve out of Christian love and duty, and they would be very profitable to the master. According to Winthrop Jordan on page 191 of White Over Black, American Attitudes Toward the Negro, 1550 to 1812, these clergymen had been forced by the circumstances of racial slavery in America into propagating the gospel by presenting it as an attractive device for slave control. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> most slave children were prohibited from learning to read or write but if ever given a chance to do so the bible was the book to read some masters and mistresses would even read bible tales to their slaves Tremendous care was taken in the selection of biblical scriptures that could be read to the slaves. There could be no scripture references by missionaries or slave preachers to Pharaoh and Moses. Any idea about freedom was not to enter the minds of the slaves at any cost. Slave camp meetings or church sessions were closely monitored by the masters or overseers. Upon discovery of rule violations, masters would design punishment for slaves. The most popular sermons given by preachers, both white and black, were those based upon the following themes. 1. Obedience to master. 2. Loyalty to the master. 3. Theft. 4. Love your enemies. 5. Do good to those who spitefully use you. 6. Reward after death. 7. Peaceful suffering. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. And 8. Themes of guilt. In the historical narrative incidents in the life of a slave girl, Linda Brent, who was born a slave and later became a fugitive, describes a slave sermon that illustrates the above themes. Brent writes, his, the Reverend Mr. Pike, text was, Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh with fear and trembling and singleness of your heart as unto Christ. 
The minister proceeds, hearken ye servants, give strict heed unto my words. You are rebellious sinners. Your hearts are filled with all manner of evil. Tis the evil, tis the devil who tempts you. God is angry with you and will surely punish you if you don't forsake your wicked ways. You that live in town are eye servants behind your master's back. Instead of serving your masters faithfully, which is pleasing in the sight of your heavenly master, you are idle and shirk your work. God sees you. You tell lies. God hears you. Instead of being engaged in worshiping him, you are hidden away somewhere. Feasting on your master's substance, tossing coffee grounds with some wicked fortune teller, or cutting cards with another old hag. Your masters may not find you out, but God sees you and will punish you. Oh, the depravity of your hearts. When your master's work is done, are you quietly together thinking of the goodness of God to such sinful creatures? No. You are quarreling and tying up little bags of roots to bury under the doorstep to poison each other with. God sees you. You men steal away to every grog shop to sell your master's corn that you may buy rum to drink god sees you you sneak into the back streets or among the bushes to pitch coppers although your masters may not find you out god sees you and he will punish you you must forsake your sinful ways and be faithful servants obey your old master and your young master your old mistress and your young mistress if you disobey your earthly master you offend your heavenly master you must obey god's commandments when you go from here don't stop at the corners of the streets to talk but go directly home and let your master and mistress see that you have come and this is out of linda brent's book incidents in the life of a slave girl oh they made me sick it's called trichonology had nothing to do with the true teachings of jesus it's nothing but a slave making method mm -mm -mm. It was fed thoroughly into the minds of slaves that it was indeed the will of God that they not only occupy their lowly positions, but that they also maintain these positions for life. A tremendous offense to God would be a recalcitrant slave. Ooh, recalcitrant? I don't have my uh my paper dictionary and I'm using my phone so I can't look it up, but I can use context clues. A tremendous offense to God would be a recalcitrant slave. Mm, what does recalcitrant mean? It sounds like it means a tremendous offense to God will be a recalcitrant slave, like a disobedient slave. Impudence and outspokenness to the master would also be disliked by God. Much of this kind of thinking can still be found operating in the minds of African peoples today. Threats of eternal damnation and suffering in hell would influence the slave mentality through sermons. Severe beatings were given to slaves for committing those these offenses against the master. In the language of a popular sermon subject, these whippings or beatings were called correction. An exact quotation of the following sermon by the Reverend William Meade is set out below to give the reader a a good understanding of how slave masters through the voices of white Christian ministers who themselves may have owned slaves also tried to control the minds of slaves to the point that the slaves would accept this correction. There's only one circumstance which may appear grievous that I shall now take notice of, and this is correction. Now, when correction is given you, you either deserve it or you do not deserve it. But whether you deserve it or not, it is your duty, and Almighty God requires that you bear it patiently. You may perhaps think that it is a hard doctrine, but if you consider it rightly, you must needs think otherwise of it. Suppose, then, that you deserve correction. You cannot but say that this is just and right. You should... You cannot but say that it is just and right you should meet with it suppose you do not or at least you do not deserve so much or severe correction for the fault you have committed you perhaps have escaped a great many more and are at last paid for all or suppose you are quite innocent of what is laid to your charge and suffer wrongfully in that particular thing it is not possible that you have done some other bad it is not possible that you have done some other bad which was never discovered and the almighty God who saw you doing it would not let you escape without punishment at one time or another. And ought you not in such a case give glory to him and be thankful that he would rather punish you in this life for your wickedness than destroy your soul for it in the next life? But suppose that even this was not the case, a case hardly to be imagined and that you have by no means known or unknown deserved the correction you suffer. There is this great comfort in it that if you bear it patiently and leave your cause in the hands of God he will reward you for it in heaven and the punishment you suffer unjustly here shall turn to your exceeding great glory hereafter this is from the book American Negro Slave Revolts thank you brother DJ Maestro um, 
learn to pronounce adjective recalcitrant having an obstinately uncooperative attitude toward authority or discipline. Oh, wow. Okay. <coughs> so, a recalcitrant slave. God went like a recalcitrant slave. Okay. Thank you for looking that up. Um, an excellent way to understand the impact of religion and education on the minds of Africans during slavery is to study what the slaves themselves have said about the subject. This is illustrated by the following personal accounts from the victims themselves in a chapter entitled Religion and Education in the book Bullwhip Days, The Slaves Remember, an Oral History of Slavery. Noah had three sons, and when Noah got drunk on wine, one of his sons laughed at him, and the other two took a sheet and walked backward and threw it over Noah. Noah told the one who laughed, your children will be hewers of wood and draw drawers of water for the other two children, and they will be known by their hair and their skin being dark. So, miss, there we are, and that is the way God meant us to be. We have always had to follow the white folks and do what we saw them do, and that's all there is to it. You just can't get away from what the Lord said. Gus Rogers. So it has different excerpts from different um, slaves. So here's another one. We went to the white folks' church, so we sit in the back on the floor. They allowed us to join their church whenever one got ready to join or felt that the Lord had forgiven him of his sins. We told our determination. This is what we said. I feel that the Lord has forgiven me of my sins. I have prayed, and I feel I am a better girl. I belong to Master so-and-so, and I am so old. The white preacher would then ask our miss and master what they thought about it and if they could see any change. They would get up and say, I know that she don't steal, and I know that she don't lie as much, and I know that she works better. Then they let us join. We served our mistress and master in slavery time and not God. That, that was a excerpt from Sarah Douglas. Our master took his slaves to meeting with him. There was always something about that I couldn't understand. They treated the colored folks like animals and would not hesitate to sell and separate them, yet they seemed to think they had souls and tried to make Christians of them. That's from Melinda Discus. Oh, that reminds me of, I'm also reading um this book about, about Fannie Lou Hamer, and it was talking about um her, I believe it was her grandmother, her mother's mother that was born a slave. Fannie Lou Hamer. Her mother, was her mother a slave or her grandmother was a slave? I know Fanny grew up as a sharecropper. Okay, so Fanny's mother was a sharecropper and her grandmother was a slave. So anyways, um, it talked about how like the grandmother got sold off so many times like for a, for, like, for a sow, which I think is a pig. You get sold off for a pig or whatever. And that woman had 23 kids, y'all. Three of them were hers by her black husband. 20 of them were by different white men that she kept getting sold off to different plantations. Chad, that thing broke my heart. And when you think about it, how many people, families that that's the case for. And then they had so many kids back then. So she had 20, mind you, uh, three of them, 23. Three of them was intentionally made by her and her black husband. The other 20 was mixed race kids that was forced upon her by the master. Then, and so Fanny's mom is one of the three kids that she meant to have. So Fanny's mom ended up having like 20 something kids with her black husband and they were sharecroppers. Um, and I just think about the dynamic of the times back then too. You, well, we didn't have birth control, but also like you had to have that many kids to help, especially if you was living in them times to help you work and accrue more money. So you can have more hands helping you out. This is so sad. Who? They would not hesitate to sell or separate them, yet they seem to think they had souls and tried to make Christians out of them. And when you think of it from that perspective, it's like, how can you even follow what is being taught to you or what or how you have been brainwashed and just taken away from everything spiritual that you practice prior to enslavement. And these people are doing the most heinous things in the name and the sake of religion and God and Jesus. Like it just don't, it don't add up. It don't make sense. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> okay. So here's another quote from Alice Sewell. They did allow us to go to church on Sunday about two miles. Oh, they did allow us to go to church on Sunday about two miles down the public road, and they hired a white preacher to preach to us. He never did tell us nothing, but we good servants pick up old Marcy and old Miss things. 
Oh, Massa. Oh, Marcia. Oh, God, she country. Oh, Jesus. Sometimes it's hard to read this country stuff. Um, Pick up old Marcia and old Mr. Steens about the place and don't steal no chickens or pigs and don't lie about nothing. And then they baptize you and call that you got religion. Never did say nothing about a slave dying and going to heaven. When we die, they bury us next day and you is just like any other cattle on the place. That's all tis to it and all tis to you. You is just dead. That's all. That was Alice Sewell. I's been preaching the gospel and farming since slavery time. I joined the church 83 years ago when I was a slave of Master God, G-A-U-D. Till freedom, I had to preach what they told me to. Master made me preach to the other niggas that the good books say that if niggas obey their master, they will go to heaven. I knew there was something better for them, but I dare tell them so, lest I done it on the sly. That... I did lots. I told the niggers, but not so master could hear it, that if they keep praying, the Lord will hear their prayers and set them free. And that was a quote by the Reverend Anderson Edwards. Here's another one. They sent us to church regular, and the preacher said to us, any of you, gonna, any of you all see anybody selling, stealing old Miss Chickens or eggs, go straight to old Miss and tell her who tis and all about it. Anyone steal old Marcia Halls or anything belong to old Marcia, go straight to him and tell him all about it. Then he asked us, what your daddy bring home Bring home to you when he come home? And what he feed you chilling at night? We scared to, to death to tell anything because if we did, the nigga get a killing. And our mammy tie up our feet and hang us upside down by our feet, build a fire under us and smoke us, scare us plumb to death. We swear mammy going to burn us up. Lord, child, that was an awful scare. Yes, mammy was. The old preacher told us, go on work hard and tell old miss and old marcia the truth and when we die god gonna let us in heaven's kitchen to sit down and rest from all this work we doing down here we believed that then we didn't know no better honest we didn't honey our old miss tell used to tell us i want all my niggers to always tell the truth if they kill you die telling the truth <sighs> that's not funny but what the fuck <laughs> If they kill you, die telling the truth. What? Why would you be killing me? If they die, if they kill you, die telling the truth. But bless your soul, our mammy done smoke enough, enough of us upside down to not tell them white folks nothing. A lie nor the truth. No siree. Who want to get smoked up? Likely to burn up hanging there as not. No sir. Tell them white folks they find out anything, they just find out by themselves. That's it. That's a quote from Delia Hill. Marster preached to the white folks Sunday morning. Then the night all the marsters round that country send they slaves and they preached to us. He had about two he had two favorite tests he used to preach from to the slaves. One was servants obey your master. He didn't say much about the master in heaven, but allow but always told us to obey our earthly masters. The other text was thou shalt not steal. He preached that over and over to the niggers. They couldn't read their Bible, so they had her Believe just what he said. Since I got reading and studying, I see some of the church, uh, churches is wrong and the preachers they don't preach just like the Bible say. That's from Jack White. My pappy, he had a stolen junk. He had a stolen education. That was cause his mistress back in South Carolina helped him learn to read and write before he left there. You see, in them days, it was against the law for slaves to read. That was from James Singleton. You'll be surprised at what my mammy told me about how she got her learning. She kept a school book hid in her bosom all the time. And the white children got home from school. She would ask them lots of questions uh, about what they had learned that day. And because she was proud of every little scrap of book learning she could pick up, the white children learned how to read and write too. And all the learning she ever had, she got from the white children at the big house. And she was so smart at getting them to learn her that out of the war was over, she got to be a school teacher. That's Alice Green. No, sir. The white people, they did not try to help me learn to read and write. They said they did not have time to fool with us as we were too thick-headed to ever learn anything. Anna Lee. <clears throat> and all of these is from a book called Bullwhip Days, The Slaves Remember, an Oral History of Slavery, um, written by James Mellon.
The Bible was the only book that the masses of slaves knew anything about, and there was an intense desire to learn to read that book. When a slave would learn to read, there would be excitement among other members of the slave community, and it was the duty of a knowledgeable person to spread that knowledge to other family members and friends. Along with the Bible was also a spelling book and a first reader. Early slave owners began to agree to teach the slaves to read and write because it was felt that they could not profit from the benefit of Christian civilization unless they could at least read and write. It was advocated strongly by the slave master that slaves learn to read the Bible. Slave owners who did not teach the slaves to read the Bible were severely criticized. Also, other kinds of religious literature were deemed necessary for the slaves to read. In a book entitled A Spark for My People, the author Ella Cotton, uh, the granddaughter of an ex-slave, makes the following comment about reading in her chapter called The Formative Years. As a child, I saw the good book and also Poor Richard's Almanac in everyone's home. There were no current newspapers or magazines that I knew of. Besides the good book in our home, Grandfather had somehow got a copy of Pilgrim's Progress. As soon as I had been inducted into school life and had some understanding of the give and take behavior of life, my rights and your rights, together with an idea of the purpose of school, which is to learn how to think and on what to think, Grandfather began supplementing my education by teaching me to read the Bible. First, it was the Psalms, which he taught me to read accurately. After that came the Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and the New Testaments. And later, the, through grandfather's spiritual power, I was relatively able to perceive and feel something of the exalted spirit in which the old lawgiver must have been enveloped as he sat down to write the majestic and immortal words, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Again, this is uh, written by Ella Cotton from her book, A Spark With My People. My phone on 50%, so let me hurry up. And the chapter's almost over. The form of years or early years of a child's life, these are the years in which the mind is impressionable, easily influenced, shaped, formed, and molded. The mind of young Ella Cotton fed upon the Bible in the book Pilgrim's Progress. Pilgrim's Progress is an allegorical story of the life of a Christian. Written by John Bunyan, the book has been translated in over 100 languages and dialects and has been used to colonize the minds of the African people. The only other book translated into more languages is the Bible. A According to Nana Eku Butwiku, in order to get the African mind, Europeans began to translate the Bible into African languages, and by 1876, some portion of the Bible had been translated into 50 languages. The whole Bible was translated into seven languages, and the New Testament into nine languages. By 1926, the translations had grown to 244. After the first 50 years, the breakdown was as follows. 28 complete versions of the Bible, 59 New Testaments, some books in 138 languages, and some selected passages in 19 more. In other words, since 1876, 194 Bible translations had occurred. And this is from Nana Budwicki from her book, 500 Years of European Behavior, Its Effect on Africa and African People. Africans manufactured into slaves in the United States were prepared through a process of seasoning. In one to three years, there was a complete alteration of the psyche of the African woman and man in the Caribbean and in America. Christianity was a very effective tool in this process. An important part of the indoctrination was for slaves to serve their masters out of Christian love and duty. Slave masters and slave preachers alike designed special sermons for assurance that slaves will remain in their proper places. Personal accounts from victims themselves clearly show the tremendous impact of religion and education on the minds of Africans during slavery. Even today, with the world's technology, the scriptures are heard on CDs, the internet, and several other ways to penetrate the mentality of oppressed people. I need to look into that book, Pil Pilgrim's Progress. An allegorical story of the life of a Christian. I want to see what that's about. Well, thank you all for tuning in. This, um, The next chapter will be... Uh, wait a minute. Oh, no. This is still... Oh, we're still in chapter 5. Oh, well, I'm still stopping here. Okay, we're still in chapter 3. Okay, so the next portion of chapter 3 will be the horse training methods applied to enslaved Africans and the tale of black beauty. Oh, and here's a picture of one of the mistresses reading the Bible to slave children. So we're going to stop there and pick up on it maybe later this evening.
maybe another time. All right. I appreciate y'all. Make sure y'all check this out. Recapturing the African Mind by Brother Bruce Bridges. And I hope y'all have an amazing day. Be peace, be love, be light. Drink some water. Eat some fruit and vegetables. Treat yourself and your body and your night and, and your peoples around you nicely. Let people know that you love them. Give them their flowers while they're here. Tomorrow's not promised. We never know the day, the day or the hour. All right. Peace, y'all.